Before we get into the details of the changes, it's going to be helpful to spend a little bit of time uh, looking at the reasons behind these changes and some of the challenges that exist. The challenges that exist in Texas and elsewhere uh, focus primarily on the fact that mental health and related issues often are addressed by default as a criminal justice system issue and a court system issue rather than a health issue. By default, courts and the criminal justice system are required to address issues that otherwise have not been addressed or treated. It is estimated that 20 to 24 percent of the Texas inmate population has a mental health need. This translates to approximately $650 million in annual local justice system costs. In fiscal year 2011, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice spent more than $130 million on mental health and substance abuse services. In 2010, there were eight adults with severe and persistent mental illness in jail or prison for every adult in a state psychiatric hospital. The challenges are also reflected in the fact that there are approximately 36,000 persons in Texas with complex medical and mental health needs. These are persons who frequently appear in emergency rooms or are frequently arrested in connection with mental illness based activities or crimes that are committed. They're stabilized and then released uh, in relatively short term without long term stabilization, which results in rearrest or rehospitalization. And the cycle continues again and again. A related issue involves long waits at state psychiatric hospitals. Texas has seen increases in length of stay and waiting lists at state hospitals. As of fiscal year 2015, there were 2,463 beds available. The, the ability to meet the demand is not there at present. The demand outstrips the number of beds and the facilities themselves uh, are in need of repair, expansion, and refurbishment. Length of stay has increased from an average of 58 days in 2012 to 74 days in 2015. The waiting list for these beds has more than quadrupled since 2013. As of January 2016, it stood at 424 individuals. This has implications when we talk about issues related, for example, to competency restoration involving Class B uh, misdemeanors. The maximum sentence uh, for Class B misdemeanor is 180 days. That uh, limit can be bumped up against when long waiting list lists uh, combine with other system delays to result in a procedure that goes beyond the time period that is the maximum amount of time that a defendant could serve for the charged offense. There are other key challenges as well. These challenges involve providing appropriate treatment for specific populations, the persons with complex needs that, that we discussed before, also those people experiencing their first episode of psychosis who enter into a school system or a criminal justice system or a hospital system. Other challenges involve providing appropriate local and outpatient treatment in the community and addressing the shortage of mental health professionals and resources, particularly in rural areas. Let's focus for a moment on the big picture. Texas needs effective mental health screening and information sharing across public systems. It needs system planning, financing, and implementation of diversion programs for mentally, in, mentally ill individuals who are involved in the justice system and it needs implementation and financing of community and jail-based competency restoration. To address these big picture of concerns and these other challenges, the state has responded on multiple fronts. One of those fronts is the creation of the Texas Judicial Council Mental Health Committee in 2016. 
The committee's charge is to examine the administration of civil and criminal justice for those suffering from or affected by mental illness in Texas. To review approaches for diversion of individuals with mental illness from the criminal justice system. To make recommendations on improving the administration of justice in cases involving mental health issues with a focus on strategies for enhancing judicial leadership and creation of a permanent judicial commission on mental health and to make recommendations on legislative changes. The underlying all of this is a recognition of a need for resources to create additional options to address these challenges. In October of 2016, the Judicial Council made a series of recommendations in anticipation of the 85th legislative session. There were three recommendations in particular that focused on improvements to existing statutes and programs. These recommendations focused on improving screening protocols under Article 1622, also increasing flexibility for uh, personal recognizance bonds, uh, and making sure that those bonds are available for mentally ill, nonviolent defendants under Article 17.032. A second recommendation focused on allowing communities to offer competency restoration and maintenance under Article 46B in safe and clinically appropriate local settings for misdemeanor defendants. This potentially encompasses outpatient residential, community inpatient, or jail-based opportunities for treatment for competency restoration. Another recommendation focused on improving procedures for reimbursing counties for restored inmates' medication. A third recommendation focused on providing funding for jail diversion programs tailored to local needs, resources, and conditions. The Texas judiciary is by no means the only uh, entity or stakeholder focusing on these issues. The House Select Committee on Mental Health, chaired by Representative Four Price, issued a comprehensive interim report in December of 2016. That interim report covers not only the specific procedures that we're going to discuss today, but also a range of policy concerns and solutions for a range of issues related to mental health in Texas. In his State of the Judiciary Address in 2017, Chief Justice Nathan Hecht added his voice calling for attention to procedures for mentally ill defendants in Texas. As a result of these initiatives and others, multiple mental health related bills were introduced during the 85th legislature. We're going to focus on particularly three of the key bills for purposes of this presentation. There were a number of bills that were passed uh, but the ones that are of particular focus here are Senate Bill 1326. This bill addressed mental health screening under Article 1622, personal recognizance bonds under Article 17032, and competency restoration for misdemeanor defendants under Article 46B. Additionally, Senate Bill 292 established a matching grant program to reduce recidivism arrests and incarceration among individuals with mental illness. House Bill 13 created a matching grant program through the Health and Human Services Commission to support community mental health programs. And together, these funding opportunities will help to develop the local options that the statutes are designed to encourage. Other mental health legislation that bears attention includes Senate Bill 1849, also known as the Sandra Bland Act. We'll talk about the Sandra Bland Act uh, a little bit in more detail shortly. Uh, it has some overlap with the Senate Bill 1326 provisions addressing mental health screening under Article 1622. It also has additional provisions related to jail standards, reporting requirements, uh, procedures for investigating jail deaths uh, and training for jail administrators that are beyond the scope of this particular presentation. The next three segments of the presentation are going to focus on individual statutory procedures. These are jail screening, 
personal recognizance bonds, and competency restoration. Before we get into the details of those procedures, there are two overarching points to bear in mind. The first is that all of the changes that we are discussing are changes to existing statutes and existing procedures designed to fine tune them and improve them in order to better address the needs and challenges that arise at the intersection of mental illness and the criminal justice system. The second point to bear in mind when we look at all of these uh, individual changes is that none of these changes are intended to or will have the effect of replacing the individual judgment of frontline magistrates and judicial officers in addressing the challenges that exist at this intersection of mental illness and the criminal justice system. All of the procedures we are discussing are aimed at providing additional information and additional options to better handle the challenges. Individual judges and individual magistrates will continue to have the flexibility that they need to respond to individual cases. With those understandings, let's turn to the first focus of these new procedures, additional procedures, which is changes to the screening program. 